All right. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Sikowski. I'm a professor at the University of Toledo, and I lead this project called Globe Mission Earth. And some of the people on, I see David Padgett and uh, Peter Garrick, Boston University. P uh, David's from Tennessee State University. Uh, there's some teachers we worked with. Uh, Kathleen, I see from Boston University. Uh, those are some of our partners, and we're hoping we'll have funding for another five years. Well, you know, we've been having these webinars. This, this is maybe the last one of the year. We talked today about maybe doing a phenological garden one in May. So that might be interesting uh, for everybody to attend. Um, let's see, I said I was a professor at the University of Toledo and I thought I would start out, let's see if I can do a PowerPoint. Uh, oh yeah, this is usually how my computer crashes. Let's see how this works. I should have just showed, just gone through. All right, you can maybe see something. <laughs> All yeah. right, so today uh, we we're finishing up the Urban Heat Island campaign, um, you know, after March, uh, getting over, and maybe looking at some ways to make your neighborhood less hot. Uh, we'll see how that works. Um, this is Globe Mission Earth, and I mentioned some of the partners. Uh, NASA Langley is another partner, WestEd, uh, UC Berkeley, and then our reach map. So these are uh, the teachers and universities and informal education centers that work with us across the country. <clears throat> so I'll just do a little intro, and then we'll have uh, Jody Haney students from Bowling Green State University uh, talk about their project, and then Matt Pierce from Goddard, and Elizabeth Sebastian and, um, from New York City uh, talking about her uh, project that she's done, um, and I think received an award for. All right, so how can we make our cities not hot? Um, now, I, I, the next slide is going to be an EPA page, but I'll start with this one. This is a project that students in the Dominican Republic did using the surface temperature campaign. Uh, they have blacktop playgrounds at all the schools in the Dominican Republic. And that, that's my understanding from Maria, who's the teacher there at Notre Dame Academy. And um, her kids looked at different paint colors to paint the blacktop and they found that green was the best color and it keeps things cooler. Uh, white's actually a little too bright, it's too reflective. So green is a real good color to cool things down. So if you have blacktop, you can paint it green and it'll cool things down. Uh, this is an EPA website, it has different um, ways of addressing uh, heat islands and you know, getting your neighborhood cooler. Of course, one is tree cover. Uh, this is a picture from a while back. You can tell, well, maybe you can tell the cars are old. Uh, elm trees were the big thing in the US. You know, they line the streets and they have a really good canopy cover for shading, They're like big umbrellas. Of course, Dutch elm disease killed a lot of them and, and all these, these trees lined this uh, suburban blocks, had to be cut down. Now I, I grabbed some Images, this is uh, current uh, for Toledo, downtown. I don't see any vegetation at all. And so therefore, this, this area could use some vegetation, some trees, uh, maybe green roofs. You know, so there's uh, dark roofs, uh, lots of parking lots, could paint some green. Um, and this is the neighborhood I lived in in Toledo. The first 10 years I lived in this area. And you notice all the trees. So the neighborhoods have large trees now. Um, you know, building houses built in the 60s, so the trees were about 50 years old. One of the challenges I was talking to one of my students uh, today is that in some of these neighborhoods, the trees are too old, they're too big. And so now you have trees falling on houses. Um, so that's, and they're very expensive to cut down, over $1,000 to cut down a large tree. So that's one of the concerns. So, but planting trees can uh, cool an area down, vegetation. All right, so just looking at some of the data from March for the Urban Heat On campaign for GLOBE. Uh, and uh, as you might imagine this, uh, the campaign got about halfway through the month and then things shut down pretty much across the world. Um, this was one of the days kind of before the big shutdown. Uh, you see how the Middle East was pretty warm, uh, cool still in the Great Lakes. Um, 
I just I wanted to let's see, point out. Oh, you know, I had other images. This is Malta, by the way. Um, my wife's family is from Malta, and uh, they actually did a fair number of observations. It's a island nation in the Mediterranean Sea, south of Sicily, uh, with about 430,000 inhabitants. And you can see it's fairly urban in spots. And this one, um, whoever was taking these observations, uh, I know a guy, uh, Joe there, um, it was warmer in the street than, I think this was the farm field. This is like a little bit of a hay field, has walls around it. So their, their farm fields are small, but it was actually quite a bit cooler than the uh, street itself. So I wanted to just show that as an example of, um, you know, a, a study that someone in another country was doing. I did want to just mention a couple other things, or one thing, one other thing, uh, clouds. And um, people have been taking cloud observations uh, through the shutdown. Um, there's actually a fair number in the Michigan and Ohio area. Uh, we did have some Facebook posts about taking cloud observations, something to engage your kids in. And I wanted to show um, two schools. This is in Florida. And this is on one day. This is uh, April 1st. Uh, so the teacher in Florida, Monte Verde Academy, had as a homework assignment, having the kids download the Globe Observer app and taking cloud observations. And they did that for about two weeks. And you can see on one day, I don't know, I can't even count that many, 40 maybe observations on one day for that school. I mean, an excellent data set actually for research, for scientists, NASA scientists. Um, one of the things that's changed is that we now have less contrails it looks like right less planes in the air and uh, studying how contrails affect our climate um, and also just validating the cloud algorithms on the satellites and so a data set like this would be is invaluable and then i just wanted to highlight this is the other school i've seen this is in dearborn heights uh, crestwood high school uh, diana johns is the teacher and obviously, um, this is April 20th. She had her students do this as a homework assignment. These are the two I know of. I, I'm, I suspect that um, some schools in Saudi Arabia have done this, uh, but there weren't as concentrated observations on single days. But I thought, you know, this is something that kids can do at home with, uh, you know, the, 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 the Globe Observer app is take, the, take cloud observations, not too hard. Uh, you know, that's only in places where kids can go outside, of course. All right, so these are our contact information. Um, my son getting killed in soccer, <laughs> slide tackle. Hope we get to play soccer again someday. Uh, Facebook page, our uh, URL, that type of thing. All right, so having said all that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jody and her students. I gotta stop sharing. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Kevin, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Okay, so while I'm uh, setting this up, if my students would turn on their uh, videos and unmute yourself since you're going to be speaking here very soon. Um, I just would like to say thanks for the opportunity to present. This is awesome. Our students are from a program called Action, Science and Math in Action. And it's a Choose Ohio First program, grant program. So the incoming freshmen go through a uh, three-week summer bridge program. And during that summer bridge program, I teach a one-week globe course. And we study surface temperature together. And all the students do their own independent research on, on surface temperature in July on campus, which is really interesting. Um, and then the freshman year, during the academic year, they work with smaller teams and smaller groups. And they do undergraduate research with a professor. So these are my six students who chose to work with me this year, and we took on a study on surface temperature as well. Their sophomore year, they do a little internship with, in business and industry, and then their junior and senior years, they work on an action research project, um, thinking about how they can implement an educational innovation, like whatever, collaborative learning or hands-on science or using uh, citizen science in the classroom, and then they measure the impact on uh, student learning and student motivation and things like that. Um, these students have been with me since uh, the summer, um, and I am proud and inspired by their resilience during this COVID-19 uh, dilemma. 
pandemic. And uh, like I said, this is a really great opportunity for them to show what they know. And so we thank you for that. And without further ado, Zoe, you're going to take it away as soon as I share my screen. And all right, Zoe, you're on. Um, yeah, Adrian. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> Hi, I'm Adrian McGann, and I'm majoring in middle childhood education with a specialization in math and science. I worked with Zoe Berger, Allison Blanc, Allison Cheek, Bryce Ferguson, and Jared Blueling. Our group of action students from BGSU performed a research study um, studying the surface, air, and floor temperatures to find the hottest and coolest spots on campus. We did this to try to find solutions to cool down the hot spots and overall have a more sustainable campus. Our director for this research project was Dr. Jody Haney, and we collaborated with the GLOBE program and Choose Ohio First to complete this project. And you can go to the next slide. Surface temperature is a temperature near or at the Earth's surface. Looking at this figure, you can see that as solar energy comes in from the sun, about half of the heat is absorbed by land and oceans, but the other half is radiated back into the atmosphere. Ultimately, this warms the air and contributes to why we have an urban heat island effect and why we should make a cognizant effort to cool down our campus and cities. Hi, everybody. I'm Allie. I'm majoring in high school math education. So it's important to investigate surface as well as air temperature because especially during the summer, the increased surface and air temperatures have a large negative impact on our environment and our community. One of these negative impacts is the increased need for cooling inside of buildings. According to the EPA, the raise in air temperature results in five to 10% more demand for electricity. While using more electricity is damaging to the environment, it is also more expensive for owners. Additionally, companies that, that use electricity rely on fossil fuels to meet the demand for power, which leads to an increase in air pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions. Primary pollutants include sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and particulate matter as shown in the first image. With an increase in air pollution, this can lead to human health concerns such as respiratory difficulties. The increase in surface temperature and air temperature can cause humans to experience heat cramps and, exhaust and exhaustion, non-fatal heat stroke, and heat-related mortality. In fact, more people die of heat than any other natural disasters combined. These conditions are specifically dangerous for young children and older adults. Lastly, hotter surface temperatures heat up stormwater, and when this stormwater becomes runoff, it raises water temperatures in other bodies of water. This can potentially damage the aquatic life and ruin the water quality. You can go to the next slide. Um, so the urban heat island effect in cities can end up costing a lot of money due to the increased use of electricity for air conditioning. When the air warms up by just one degree Celsius, the demand for electricity in each building increases by anywhere from five to 20%. In Bowling Green, an action group found an urban heat island effect at three degrees Celsius, as you can see in the first graph on the screen. Therefore, BGSU is paying an extra 20% and probably more for electricity in the summer. These extra expenses could be mitigated by trying to decrease the, ur the urban heat island effect. Next slide. You can go to the next one. Hi everyone, I'm Allison Cheek. I'm majoring in middle childhood education and specializing in math, specializing in math and science. So the questions that we researched are, where are the hottest and coolest air and surface temperatures on the BGSU campus? What can be done to mitigate BGSU's urban heat island, or even urban heat island? And how can FLIR thermal cameras help investigate surface temperatures? So you can go to the next slide. So the materials that we used were the GPS app on our iPhones, the FLIR thermal camera, the globe cloud chart, infrared thermometers, a calibration thermometer, and the orange pole that you can see in the picture was the control for the height of finding the surface temperature data collection. And we also used clipboards, pencils, data sheets, and the Globe Observer app. Next slide. Over an eight week period, our research team measured air surface and floor temperatures at seven natural locations, such as grassy locations or water, such as ponds. 
and at five man-made locations, for example, parking lots and rooftops throughout BG's campus. We collected nine measurements at each location. All data was reported to the GLOBE database. So you can see here uh, the FLIR landscape versus the surface pictures. In the FLIR pictures, the hotter temperatures are represented by red, yellow, and orange colors, while the cooler temperatures are represented by blue, purple, and green colors. And next slide. Hi everyone, I'm Zoe and I'm a 7 to 12 math education major. So the first results we want to go over is overall how do all the surfaces we investigated compare based on the measures of surface temperatures taken with IR thermometers and the air temperatures. You can see that the man-made surfaces designated with the light blue bars had overall higher temperatures than the natural surfaces which are designated with the green bars. The darker blue line through the graph represents the air temperatures at each location. The man-made surfaces all had surface temperatures higher than the air temperatures, while the natural surfaces were all lower than the air temperatures. We have put asterisks on the graph to help show which of the surfaces were the highest and which were the lowest. Next slide. So here we have a comparison of some of our natural surfaces along with the air temperatures at these locations. From here, we can conclude a couple of things. First off, water is an insulator. The rec pond that we collected data at on campus, shown by the darker blue bar, had the same surface temperature and air temperature. And also the fountain and cemetery both had lower temperatures. We've concluded that these are inconclusive results because there might have been tree coverage at these points. Overall, all the natural surfaces are below the air temperatures at their points and help to mitigate heat from campus. Next slide. The next slide. I did the next slide. Isn't it, it, did it come through yet? I don't think so. Uh, it should be the one that says uh, surface temperature and air temperature with natural surfaces. Is we're that on not the roof types. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Hello, I'm Bryce and I am a high school math education major. So as we can see in this graph comparing surface temperature and air temperature, uh, the air temperature stayed relatively consistent among all four roofs. However, we see that the stone roof and green roof uh, proved to be much cooler than the black roof and even the white roof, which actually didn't reduce heat very well well at all. This came as a bit of a shock as the white roof was expected to be one of the best performers for mitigating heat. Next slide please. Now this graph compares surface temperatures recorded using two different devices, an IR thermometer and a FLIR camera. Looking at it, we can't tell that the FLIR, or looking at it, we can tell that the FLIR camera we tested uh, were pretty true to our IR thermometer readings for the most part, with the exception of the white roof and black roof. They work pretty well everywhere else, leading us to the conclusion that FLIR cameras are best used to find or provide evidence of heat in cool, or hot and cool temperatures, um, but not necessarily to give exact measurements. Next slide, please. Uh, so there were a few limitations we found when conducting our research. Uh, for instance, we discovered that the floor cameras had a pretty short battery life, especially when it was cold out. Uh, we also had we also only had two floor cameras, so not each group could have one every week. Uh, another aspect that was a bit of an issue was that we were doing a study on heat patterns, but during the later months of the year, we did not always have the warmest weather. Uh, for our next steps, we have written a grant proposal to the BGSU Green Fund Committee, who has a large pot of money to be used on projects that make BGSU as environmentally friendly as possible. Um, our proposal is asking for a bit of money to put a stone roof on a dorm on campus campus that does not have air conditioning, which we think would reduce heat and save BG money. Next year's GLOBE group could measure the outcome of any solutions we install this year. Next slide, please. 
Hello, I'm Jared and I major in grades 7 through 12 math education. The possible solutions to the problem we are investigating are adding more vegetation around campus, adding more green roofs on campus, adding more cool roofs and cool pavements, and adding small rocks to roofs. We are investigating these possible solutions because natural surfaces have cooler temperatures than man-made surfaces. Our main goal is to cool surfaces closer to the living spaces so that it will keep the students cooler since most are non-air conditioned. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As you heard earlier, when Bryce mentioned the Green Fund, we came up with a Green Fund proposal to put some stone on one of our dorms. The benefits of this include increased energy efficiency in the, of the building, extended life of the asphalt roof, and it will help decrease the urban heat island index around Bowling Green. Thanks for listening. This concludes our presentation. At this time, we'll take any questions that you have. And this is our references. You guys did a great job. Thank you. Uh, I think it puts uh, UT students to shame. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so if we uh, could get a video, I, I think Janet's recording, so we'll clip out your presentation and I'll show it to my students. Say, hey, this is what you could do too. <laughs> There are questions for the Bowling Green students. I have uh, a question. Does anybody is anybody reading yes. the chat or could I, should I read it? Uh, uh, it says, "Why small white rocks on the roof when it looks like green paint would be better?" Maybe. I can take this question. Um, so we found that both the white rocks and like the green roofs would help to mitigate the heat, but the cheaper option is going with the small white rocks. So that is why we chose to do this option first and kind of start leading to a cooler campus. And then in the future, we could look at green paint or green roofs. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think uh, the work from the Dominican Republic is was it Dominican Republic? Yes, yes. Uh, it was fascinating. And I think that when we do our testing next year, we could, we could incorporate that into our testing and put some green paint up there to, to, to look at. We're gonna keep the asphalt roof, we could do green paint roof, and then we could do our stone roof and see how the three compare. That would be really cool. Um, I got a question uh, from Bo um, about the weight of the rocks. Would there be any issue with putting extra weight on the roof? Anybody want to take that or should I take it? I know Bryce and Jared, you were kind of looking at some of that stuff. Did you come in, did you research any of the, the weight limitations and so forth? I personally did not notice anything about the weight being a problem. I did not see anything about weight either actually. Um, I, I talked to a, uh, we originally found a company that uh, we, we bid out for about $5,000 to cover 50,000 square feet, which is less than 10 cents a square foot, which is really, really low cost. But I found another place in Ohio, and so we asked them for a quote. We're waiting to hear back from that. But they had told me that they think we need more stone than what the other company did. But they did talk about weight, but they said as long as you keep it, you know, you have to have your building uh, person really look at the engineering of it all, but usually they can add uh, an inch or two inches of stone without any trouble at all uh, as far as weight limitations go. So that was encouraging. And uh, David Padgett asked, was the FLIR camera handheld or on a drone? The FLIR camera actually connected into our iPhones. So that's how we took the picture. We downloaded an app on our phones and connected in the FLIR camera, and then we could take pictures from that. Okay. However, well, uh, we did buy a drone. We were trying to get a, a, a camera with the FLIR, the FLIR camera up on a, with an old iPhone up in a drone. So I have a drone sitting here waiting to be used. So I guess that'll have to be a next year thing. <laughs> trying to figure out if the drone can handle the weight of the phone and the FLIR camera and still get up to the height that we need it. Okay. Well, thanks guys. You did a great job. 
All right. Well, so our next I actually feature, have a question, if that's okay. Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, two questions. Um, how did you decide where to point your thermal cameras? And why do you think white surfaces um, gave such high readings? So for the cameras, we did that the um, the thermal thermometer was pointing straight down at the surface, so at a 90 degree angle. And then the white was kind of surprising for us, and that's something that we have to look into more. Not quite sure why. It could have been the type of building it was on, and there was like machinery on the white part of the roof. So that could have been a factor, not quite sure. All right, well, let's move on to our uh, next presenter, uh, Matt Pierce. Matt, are you all set, set to go? Yes, hi everyone. Nice to, nice to see all of you today and, and nice to see you again, Dr. C. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here to introduce Elizabeth and talk real briefly about uh, a climate change research initiative program or CCRI that we run at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Elizabeth's mentor who's here, Dr. Reggie Blake, who's one of our lead scientists studying um, urban heat island effect and, and many other uh, environmentally important subjects. So hi, Dr. Blake, great to see you today. Um, and I'm just going to do a real quick uh, screen share so I can show you a couple elements of NASA and our program. and. Um, and at the end, you can take a screenshot of my contact information. And, and in short, it's my job to help all formal and informal educators um, improve STEM and climate change education. So I really want to commend all the pre-service teachers that are beginning their careers in education. It's, a, it's an amazing ride and a dynamic opportunity to make everybody's uh, life a little bit better. Um, so if I'm correct, you should be seeing a PowerPoint. Can you all see a spinning globe? Yes. Yeah, okay. And am I on the presenter view or the, the full view? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so this is a great visualization. Um, I it think kind of encapsulates a lot I of think you're on the, uh, not the presenters, because we can see your next slide. Ah, how's that? That you're on, right. Okay, that's, that's better, all right. Um, so yes, we work at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. We're part of Goddard Space Flight Center. And our folks at what we call GIS study all types of different variables associated with the study of climate change climate impacts, and uh, we also take a look, we try to find exoplanets right, based on the, uh, the lessons we learn about our climate. Um, if you're not too familiar with NASA, we have centers all over the country and close to some of, some of you as well. We've got a Glenn Research Center in Ohio. All of our centers are, are connected and we all have very strong education programs that w really want to help and support teachers and students connect with NASA's mission and for us to support improving STEM and climate change education in your communities. Goddard is actually a five campus uh, center and our largest center is at the Greenbelt Main Campus just out of, outside of Washington, DC. We've got about 10,000 scientists and engineers there. Uh, but we also have some smaller campuses that you may have heard about. We have Wallops Flight Facility, which is a launch facility. We send a lot of payloads uh, to the space station from here. Um, the work that Elizabeth and I, I do, along with Dr. Blake, goes on at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City. Uh, we're uh, on the campus of Columbia University. We have another campus called Independent Validation and Verification. These are all of our software folks that are analyzing all of our uh, data to make sure it's accurate. And then we also have a, a balloon launch facility out in New Mexico at the White Sands Test Facility. Um, the CCRI program is predominantly focused at GIS 
for the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And as, you, as I mentioned, we do a lot of uh, global climate modeling and climate impacts. Every time you hear it's the warmest month on record or the warmest year on record, that, that probably comes from uh, a lot of our folks and our, our collaborators at NOAA. We also do a great deal of remote sensing of aerosols and clouds. The urban heat island effect is a very important focus of study for our impacts groups. And again, we also look at uh, planetary climates. The, um, our director is Dr. Gavin Schmidt. Um, I strongly encourage you to go watch his TED Talk. If you title, if you Google his name and write TED Talk, you're going to get a great 12 minutes of uh, kind of an introduction to the concept of climate modeling and, and what we're doing to uh, answer some pretty big questions. And I, I know you're in the beginning stages of, of your teaching career. And if you ever studied John Dewey, one of the things I get a kick out of is he, uh, he used to live in the building where he is right now and was a real education leader about critical thinking and uh, science instruction. But at the NASA Office of Education, which you'll, you'll also hear being called the NASA Office of STEM Engagement, we've gone through a little bit of a reinvention, and I want you to think about this as you move through your career, is we really want to immerse the public in NASA's work, enhance STEM literacy, and inspire the next generation to explore. And we do that by ultimately trying to create opportunities for students and the public to contribute to our work. And, and you're doing that with the work you're doing with GLOBE and the urban heat island effect. Our scientists at GIS assess the data that you put into GLOBE to validate what they may or may not be seeing from, from our different satellites. Um, and I just wanna uh, encourage all of you to take a look at intern.nasa.gov. And we often offer internships for teachers and pre-service teachers and young aspiring scientists. Your future students can come and potentially work with us at, uh, at NASA. So real br briefly, I want to introduce the CCRI program. And again, I'm so proud of Elizabeth Sebastian, who um, developed a really dynamic unit of instruction under the leadership of Dr. Blake and his team and uh, Dr. Stuart Gaffin and Dr. Hamid Naruzi. The, um, the CCRI program is a year-long uh, STEM engagement model where in the fall, we bring a teacher like uh, Elizabeth and a graduate student to work directly with uh, a mentor um, on a part-time basis to get really immersed in their, their research project. During the spring, um, we reconvene and similarly work on the research project, but it's at this point, once the teacher has gained some level of immersion and understanding of their research projects, that they start developing a four lesson integrative unit plan. And the idea is to translate part of your research experience into your classroom that you're teaching right now, while using NASA education content and resources and GLOBE resources. And so you're gonna see a, a, a great unit plan that may integra integrate some of the protocols you're already using. In the summer, we bring our teams back together for a full-time full basis and add a high school and undergraduate to that team. And it becomes really quite dynamic um, to have a near peer uh, mentoring model uh, that's also a vertical team. And so everyone works really hard to meet some, some high level objectives about, in this case, studying the urban heat island effect in around the New York uh, area, New York City area, and uh, finish the development of their unit plans and create scientific posters, publishable research papers, and um, comprehensive PowerPoint symposium uh, presentations that they give to various groups. So without further ado, I could, I could talk all day about how much I love the program and our teachers and our students, but if you ever want to contact me, please feel free to take a screenshot of this. Um, it's my job to help, to help you and, and get cool curriculum and, and dynamic opportunities through NASA. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ms. Elizabeth Sebastian. Thanks. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Sebastian. As Matt mentioned, I spent a couple of years at NASA GIS under the CCRI program. 
where I conducted research in the past year with Dr. Reginald Blake and studying the urban heat island effect. And during that time there, while I was researching, I developed unit plans to uh, mimic that research and implement into my classroom with my students. Uh, so I'm gonna go through a brief presentation about uh, the work I've done at the internship and then uh, the unit plan as well. I also put in the chat a link for the unit plan that's on the GIS website. And if you want a more in-depth look into the unit plan I developed, I'm doing an hour long webinar through EPDC on Thursday. So there's a sign up link for that as well. I'm gonna go ahead and just take my video off just to save bandwidth and I'll go ahead and start my presentation. Can everyone see it? Yes. Cool. All right. Uh, so my unit plan is called The Heat is On, Urban Heat Islands Detection Strategies and Mitigation Solutions. As mentioned previously, it was approved by NASA s and Product Review. Um, it takes a lot of effort to get through that review, so it was quite a handful, but I'm very proud that I was able to pass this uh, product review. And it was developed under the mentorship of Dr. Reginald Blake, uh, Dr. Hama Joseph Nuruzi, uh, Matthew Pierce, and then also his intern that works with him, Rosalba Giartano. So a little bit about me to give you a little background of my teaching career and showing how I came to be at NASA. I studied at Towson University where I got a bachelor's in education. And during my undergraduate time there, I actually presented at the Maryland Math Teachers Conference and attended the National Institute of Aerospace STEM Institute where I started to learn how to incorporate STEM into the classroom. After that, I did a little bit of teaching in Baltimore, but then moved up to New York and have been teaching at a school called Fusion Academy ever since. I am the head of the science department there and I also serve as the technology liaison. Uh, back in 2016, 2017, I was awarded Teacher of the Year for my involvement with NASA, as well as my collaboration with my teachers on campus. So during my time at Fusion, I spent three years working in the Climate Change Research Initiative. As Matt just said, I did uh, the fall and spring part-time and then the summer full-time doing research and then uh, creating unit plans. And in my first year there, our paper was published in the uh, journal Urban Climate. So I highly recommend looking it up. And then I also worked at Infiniscope and I still am doing stuff there where I created and tested uh, interactive science lessons. Uh, so I won't go through this uh, just since uh, Matt already gave you a review of the CSRI program. Uh, but what I want to introduce to you is the work I did this past year with my team and how it ties into the unit plan. It was the inspiration for all the lessons within my unit plan and also the methodology that I have students do within these lessons. Uh, we know a lot about urban heat islands and what they look like, especially from satellites. Uh, but we don't really understand too well what it's like at the neighborhood level. And as we could see at the right, there's the image of New York City uh, compiled from a lot of Landsat images, and we can see the hot spots and the cool spots. And even if I zoom in on a particular neighborhood in New York City, you can still see those in between changes. But we want to understand a little bit more of what happens at that neighborhood level and how much of that effect is felt from street to street within the neighborhood. Uh, so we saw that satellites can be great, but also have their drawbacks. Uh, Landsat 8 has great resolution, but doesn't fly over that often. It flies every 16 days over New York City. We also have geostationary satellites, but the resolution is very low in comparison to Landsat. And then as you all have encountered, you're gonna have cloudy days that are gonna block your sunlight and are gonna disrupt your tem um, temperature imaging and disrupt your data. So what we wanted to do to understand the neighborhood scale a little bit more is take ground observations with clear thermal cameras in coordination with satellites as well. So that brought to us three questions that we wanted to answer. How can satellite and ground-based data be combined to create a detailed and accurate map of urban heat on the neighborhood scale? How can these maps best be used to mitigate against and adapt to extreme heat events? And how can citizen science empower local communities to adapt to 
and mitigate extreme heat. So our methodology was to select an area of a neighborhood in Brooklyn that has a variation of temperatures. And you can see in the image on the right, there's like five little balloon icons. Those were our five locations that we did in the stretch of five blocks. Uh, so we can see there's some very hot pockets. There's also some very cool pockets as well. And at each location, we uh, observe four different types of surfaces, concrete, asphalt, soil, and grass and plants, if it was available. Some sites did not have any vegetation at all. Uh, in coronation, we used FLIR cameras and then compared it to Lancet, Terra, and Aqua data. And this is what we found. So this is all of our data points that we just threw onto a graph. And I know the text of the bond's a little small, but those are all our surface types in both shaded and unshaded areas. The line in the middle of the graph is our average uh, temperature throughout the day. So you're seeing a diurnal cycle through here. And the green squares are Terra data, and the blue triangles are Aqua data. And for the most part, it's pretty close to that average line but you can see a lot of it tends to fall below average, which started to raise some questions in our mind. We also saw that with Lancet as well, that was hugging more towards the shaded surface temperatures rather than kind of in the middle or even towards the unshaded surface temperatures. And that's something that, that we asked about with the Lancet people, and we were talking about with the angle of how they're taking pictures, how's that affecting our readings when we're trying to coordinate our ground temperatures with our satellite data as well. So all of that led to the development of my unit plan. And my main goal of the plan is to teach students how to use this innovative technology like clear thermal cameras and satellite data to understand the change in climate in urban areas and create solutions to the ongoing environmental problems in cities. So a brief overview of each lesson. Uh, lesson one is when they get their hands right into that satellite data learn how to get that satellite data, throw it onto your graph, and start to recognize patterns and trends within that data. So they're using a website called EOS Worldview, where you can download Terra and Aqua data, which is the satellites that fly over daily, twice a day, uh, just at a lower resolution. So they get familiar with how to pull data for their area and start to gather land surface temperature data. Lesson two is where the graph work comes into play. So this is where GLOBE gets introduced and they learn all the GLOBE protocols with, uh, with gathering surface temperature data and they follow all the protocols on the website and then they upload the data to the GLOBE database so we can contribute to that work as well. With that, they're comparing it to their previous uh, lesson where they saw how to get that satellite data and use it in coordination with those ground temperatures. So basically mimicking what my team did over the summer. Lesson three, they learn about urban heat island intensity and what that is. So a little bit of uh, <clears throat> what we saw at the beginning, how unshaded areas that have low vegetation are hotter because of urban development, whereas cooler areas, we see a lot of vegetation. Lesson four, we learn about one of those mitigation solutions, bioswales. This is one of those things that New York City has really pushed in developing throughout the city in order to get those cooler pockets all throughout the city and cool it down all together. So they learn about that mitigation strategy. And then finally, they come to the capstone project. So they are developing a way to study a city, use everything they learned in the first four lessons. So how to pull satellite data from their city they select, how to get ground temperature data, and then throw it onto a poster and support why mitigation solutions need to be taken place. So just to kind of break down the steps of what they do in that project, I figure I throw it out into this organizer. So step one, they select a city. Step two, they look at historical data of the city using what they did in lesson one. Step three, determine the heat island intensity, so from lesson three. Uh, step four, determine demographics of hotspots of the city. Step five, predict the future of what's gonna happen, so climate modeling. Step six, create a well-developed argument for change. Step seven, propose the plan. And then finally, create an infographic poster that will be peer-reviewed. This is just a list of the NASA resources I use in the unit. I tend to go a little crazy with NASA resources because there's so many there already with Urban Heat Island Effect. 
So I figure I'd put her in the list if you guys wanted to kind of like a snapshot of those resources. So Globe is a big one I love to use in my unit plans because it's a way to share that data with the community. Um, but there's also ways you can get data like EUS Worldview. Uh, so there's two ways that you can implement the unit plan. You can do it as a whole unit. And these are just some courses I recommend putting it into. I teach an environmental science course and a research course. So I use it in both of those courses. But you can also use the lessons independently. Like if you just wanted to do lesson two, you can do that in any course where there is a unit about environmental science or climate change or human impacts such as the last unit in my biology class, we talked about human impacts. So I use it in that. And I was also asked to talk a little bit about how the internship has impacted me. So one of the reasons I did this internship was the community STEM engagement. I like connecting with the community and being able to do that as a teacher through research was just world changing. And what I've done in the past three years at NASA is not only hold professional developments for my teachers at my school, but this past year I was given the opportunity to work with a local community center and local community group and teach them how to take ground measurements using those um, temperature probes. And we're even to show them the FLIR camera and we had a drone too as well that we were able to show them. And they continued to collect that data afterwards as well. And we were able to get their data and apply it to our research too. So as a teacher, it has really turned around not only my students' engagement, but also how I teach science. And it's something that I would do over and over again if I could. I just have to go on with my department head responsibilities. But if you're ever given an opportunity like this, I would say jump for it because it completely changed how I teach science in the classroom. And also allowed me, as I said before, to reach out to different organizations. Um, the one pictured here at the bottom right is a center in New York City that um, they actually have a climate change camp they do for one week in the summer. So I was able to go to them and give them like a short mini lesson about urban heat islands. And it's also um, helped me just meet all these wonderful people at NASA and who I could contact for more data, more education resources, or even if I need anything down the line, it helped me to get in touch with them. Any questions? Great job, Elizabeth. Thank you. I like how your project and the uh, Bowling Green students project had um, some kind of like a stewardship component to it, you know, working with the community and and, and uh, addressing issues of local community. Absolutely, yes. Um, Bo asked if you could show the second from last slide again. Oh, yes. Let me go ahead and reshare there. Uh, was that the impacts one? Well, yeah, I even heard from Bo, but. <laughs> It could be the or the community and classroom one. Can you make it bigger? Yes. Uh, so Sarah asks, what grade levels do you work with with this? Oh, yes, I forgot to say that. I work at a very small private school, so I teach sixth through 12th grade math and science, mainly science courses. So I teach everything from middle school or science to high school astronomy classes. Okay. Uh, Bo asked, is there a resiliency department in New York City planning? There, I know I've seen that before. I think it's, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt or Dr. Blake, um, with the Department of Environmental Protection, I think it's a, a side of that. Um, they shuffle terms around a lot and kind of rebrand things, so I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. 
That is true, Elizabeth. There's one of the DEP. There's also uh, a major component of the, um, the mayor's office that deals with resiliency for the city. I don't even know what that is. Can you explain that? What, what the resiliency department would be? Well, the whole, the whole idea is to make the city um, be more resilient in the face of a natural disaster or in the face of um, some adverse conditions. And there are all kinds of mitigation and adaptation strategies that the department would uh, invest in so that New York City will become more robust and better able to cope and to rebound if indeed we were um, subjected to some kind of a severe impact. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so the questions are coming quick now. <laughs> so Svetlana asks, have you linked any of the lessons uh, to the new science standards if our teachers were interested. Have you linked a new lesson? Have you linked your lessons to the new science standards? So when I created this uh, unit plan, um, I aligned it to next generation science standards, but also New York State has recently, I think it was a year or two ago, where they created their new set of standards that are aligned to NGSS. So I kind of did double there. Um, so if you're from in our state, it's aligned to NGSS standards, uh, but in New York State, it also aligns to that as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so a couple of different questions. Uh, well, statements. Jody um, Haney thought that the link wasn't working. Uh, which one? Uh, for the PDF. Um, I'll for put the, the unit plan. The unit plan, Elizabeth. Oh, unit plan. Okay. Um, the link for it is on my screen right now. Okay, uh, I'll just take a shot. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, but also if you're having trouble, you can go to the NASA GIST website and on the education page, there should be a link there as well. Thank you. Uh, Don, I'll just put it in the window as well. It's, it's a slow load. It's a it's pretty sizable PDF. Um, and Don asked if you could speak to the challenges that you encountered implementing the study or advice you would have for teachers that might use this unit. Uh, challenges for me are always technology. Um, I think I put in the chat earlier that the batteries do tend to die in both sets of extreme wear, both cold and hot. Um, so having backups, if you can, I know that's not always going to be uh, feasible with classes, especially large class sizes. Um, my predecessor in the same group actually did a, I think it was a GoFundMe to get like a class set of mobile cameras. Um, so that can be challenge getting the technology. Um, with implementation, uh, since I have a smaller uh, class set, uh, it really is, I tailor it to more of the student. But my advice is take it slow, give yourself extra time. Um, this is a concept students are not that familiar with. And so they're gonna ask a lot of questions. My students tend to ask a lot of questions when it comes to climate change in general, especially in New York City and how it affects them. So allowing more time than what the unit plan says is what I highly recommend if you plan to implement it. And then uh, David Padgett asked if you had worked with any pre-service or service uh, students, college students. Um, just in the internship group itself, um, not, um, not during the program though. Mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to. Right. Well, great. Uh, are there any other questions for Elizabeth or Matt? We'll do a dramatic pause. All right. Well, if not, I think the uh, presentations were great. Thank I want to thank everyone for presenting tonight. Uh, we learned a lot about the urban heat on effect. I learned a lot about NASA GIS, which I didn't know about before. And uh, I hope uh, if we have a, a phenological garden webinar, I hope you tune into that one in May. All right. Well, thanks, everybody.
So perfect timing. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Take care. Thanks. Uh, good hey, night. Reginald, how you doing? Hey, Dave. Good to see you, my friend. See you, too.